She's my mother, she's my auntie. She's many that I've known. The backbone of the bush where country kids have grown. She's raised and she's nurtured those children of her own while her man does his battles on the land. Then he comes in from the shearing still aching in the back. The kids are finally tucked away, her days are never slack. But she makes it look so easy as she cooks him up a storm, that unselfish, unsung hero of the land. Chapter 5, That Unselfish, Unsung Hero of the Land From my position as the oldest of five boys, I can say I'm sure Mum and Dad would have loved dearly to have had a daughter. With four sons, there were more than enough boys to take over the land. My youngest brother was always a different boy to the rest of us. One Christmas holiday, we went to Mildura to take advantage of their new Olympic swimming pool and Jeff surprised us all. There was a moment at the pool when we couldn't see him. What a worry that was. Next thing there was a triumphant, Up here! And there he was, three years old, up on the high diving platform. He seemed to have no fear. Another day, I was in our backyard when I spotted him on the top of the chookyard roof. He yelled out, Wait there! He disappeared to the other end of the shed, then came hurtling towards me with a running jump. It was my responsibility to catch him. Shit, Jeff, you could have warned me, I thought. I've always felt sorry for Mum that she didn't have a girl, although it's hard to know if she would have got on with a daughter. I reckon Mum would have been quite competitive and dominating, so a girl would have had to stand up to her. To us boys, though, Mum was always very affectionate and quite soft in her approach. The only time she lashed out at me is when she grabbed a light wooden coat hanger and feebly tried to hit me with it. It was almost laughable. I found it very easy to cry any time. I didn't feel like going to school and she would let me stay at home. Not that I didn't enjoy school. One of Mum's great qualities is that she didn't speak badly of others and she definitely has never had a prejudice or a racist thought. She would invite kids from all around town to play in our yard. She was also very encouraging of our creativity. The Quambatook Presbyterian Church had an annual fete, so I was always pushed to make something crafty to enter in a competition. She told me when I was very young that if I built a little house made of moss for fairies, they would reward me with a penny. So I broke off the moss from around the gutter and built a wee little hut. Sure enough, the next day I found a penny. This was very cool. I didn't have to lose a tooth to please the fairies. I'm forever grateful to my mother for the fairies in the garden. I'm sure it stimulated a young boy's mind and was my introduction to creative thinking. Mum loved to create magic and wonder in our lives. On Christmas morning, we didn't just find our presents under a tree. No, Santa Claus left notes for us to follow, a string all around the house, through the laundry, round the veranda. Wow, a new Malvern star pushed by gleaming metallic blue in the garage. I was sworn to secrecy not to blow Santa's cover with my younger brothers. I always played along, and today I'm cross with parents who destroy that magic for their kids in the name of honesty. How can they spoil such wonderful imagination? And I wish I could ban all those fake Santa Clauses that have grown to plague proportions in the shopping centres. Shame on you retailers behind this. A child probably wakes up to the myth in no time at all these days. Putting on birthday parties was another of Mum's fortes. Just about every kid in town was invited. All down a long trestle table on the lawn, plates were piled high with bread and butter smothered in hundreds and thousands. Then there would be a treasure hunt. Little notes were hidden all round the yard explaining where the next note was to be found. She was always bringing magic into our lives. It was the town life of Quambatook that Mum enjoyed most of all. She was a born organiser and involved herself in many things, including the Country Women's Association, CWA, and the church. She was also a bit of an amateur architect and designed the baby health clinic for the town. After the old weatherboard town hall burnt down, Mum became very involved in designing the new one that is still there today. Mum has always had the knack of encouraging locals to perform 
and the energy to make things happen. Any time the town needed to raise money, she would gather the local talent, which always seemed to be in abundance, to put on a concert. I'm sure part of the reason for concerts was that she loved to sing. And when else does a farmer's wife get the opportunity to perform? Often a special guest from another town nearby was invited. I remember one year she had the entire Quambatook football team dressed up in grass skirts with half coconut bras on elastic. These concerts were always a huge success because there's nothing more entertaining than the locals making fools of themselves. Mum knew there was a performer inside most people once you got them started. Or pissed. (laughs) It still blows me away that a town the size of Quambatook, with a population of maybe 1,000, including farmers, would attempt to put on a Gilbert and Sullivan musical, but they did. Mum was always a driving force behind that. I remember seeing the Mikado. Dad took a leading role and Mum would be in the chorus. They were often guest singers in other towns too. They performed Jeanette MacDonald and Nelson Eddy duos as well as any professionals. More recently, my late Auntie Hazel told me I was the golden boy in Mum's eyes and I didn't do too much wrong to destroy that perception. I wasn't a goody two-shoes, but I enjoyed being a good boy, I suppose. I was happy to feed the chooks, cut the kindling for Mum's fuel stove and pick up half a loaf of brown bread from the local bakery on the way home from school. I was sweet on the lady who served there. She showed me how to break string with my fingers. We were five minutes' walk from the shops in Quamby and the shops were halfway to school. I might have whinged about it at the time, but I do remember quite enjoying being Mum's errand boy. I often bought her a cup and saucer or something similar for Christmas. It was only as I grew older that I thought she seemed to be too demanding of Dad. That got to me and I fought against her. It used to bother me that Dad didn't stand up for her, so I tried to do it for him. A true matriarch, she always got her own way with Dad, but he didn't seem to mind, as long as he had a good tractor and a good motor car. I've often said that Mum was one of the early women's libbers. (laughs) During hard times on the land, Mum always kept our chins up. Don't worry, the rain's coming. Look, the half moon is upside down. That means the rain will fall out she would say. Mum turned 91 in 2014. While her short-term memory is going on the phone, she still sounds 20 years younger. Apart from being very forgetful, she is as full of life as ever, and despite being a woman who designed two large houses to live in, she's as happy as Larry in one room in a retirement home in Moree. I'm so happy here, she'd say. They gave us the best room. I'm very much like my mother in many ways. I'll never rest on my laurels. I have enough projects to keep me going until I die. Same old, same old leaves me a bit bored. It gives me great confidence that all being well, I will kick on with the same energy until my bones just get too old. In our old weatherboard house in Kerrang Road, there were four bedrooms, including the two that Mum never let us sleep in because they were saved for visitors. It was the sleep-out built for workers who came and went over the years that eventually gave me some independence from my three younger brothers. I moved into it when I was about 11. The old house on Kerrang Road is still half there. The last time I inspected it, I checked out my little sleep-out and found the eye hooks still on the wall. They were there to guide a string from my bed to the switch at the door so I could turn off the light from the comfort of my own bed. In 1959, Mum's dream brick veneer home was built in Salisbury Street. Only a laneway directly behind us separated the old house and the new block of land. She named the new home Wurungai, meaning our home. I was 14 by then. Our old home was on a quarter acre block, but the new block was larger, over an acre in size. The move to Salisbury Street was just fantastic for us boys. The new house was ultra modern at the time. Robin and Peter shared a room with twin single beds, and so did Will and I. Both rooms had built in cupboards and a study desk between the cupboards that we had to share. I don't remember ever using the desk. I used to delight my younger brothers by dressing up in Dad's overcoat and old hats and putting on a crazy show while they were in bed. 
Mum added a rumpus room outside the bedrooms that was big enough for a ping-pong table, hooky board and so on. The walls were painted in all those bright fifties colours that were popular at the time. Tangerine comes to mind. In the same room, there was a complete wall of cupboards for storing preserved fruit. The new house was built on a small orchard of stone fruit trees, so Mum had plenty of peaches and apricots to fill up her tall jars. We always had this fruit for dessert at night. Mum and Dad's bedroom was at the other end of the house, alongside the beautiful visitor's room that was rarely used as usual. The lounge and the dining rooms were separated by a large sliding door to open for parties. Mum loved to entertain. The heat from the slow combustion stove in the lounge room was channelled through to the rumpus room. For me, the best room was the kitchen. The eating area was like a cafe where we would all slide in on a bench seat. Maybe this was to keep us all under control. I think Mum was ahead of the trend to have a kitchen in the main entrance to the house. Wurrungai's official entrance near the visitor's bedroom was never used. If I ever have the patience to build a house again on my land in southeast Queensland, I'd have the kitchen facing the morning sun with a patio outside and a breakfast table just like Mum had. If ever I buy another old house in the suburbs, which I never will, I would make sure the backyard had the morning sun where the kitchen is. Why am I going into details of this brick veneer house? To prove how restless Mum was. Six years after building her dream home, we were out of there and into an old homestead on Tralee, the name of the property in northwest New South Wales. By the time I was out of secondary school at Scotch College, Dad and his brother had divided up the blocks and dissolved the partnership. Dad and Mum produced five boys. Uncle Arthur and Auntie Doreen had three all of who were keen to become farmers. Without Mum, I doubt that Dad would have left dear old Combertook. It was her idea to move to Cropper Creek in 65, and if we hadn't done that, I may never have fallen in love with the variety of bush our country is blessed with. We left Combertook lock, stock and barrel. That is, we left behind tractors, trucks and machinery. <laughs>